We know war sucks. We've discovered that in some of our previous episodes. We've also heard some truly amazing human stories from these terrible dark times. And this week, we'll look at another from World War I, 1914. When instead of gunfire being heard in the trenches, it was Christmas carols. Hello, boy, we're back. And by boy, I mean John. Okay. And I'm Aaron, because we never do that. Thank you. We are Merry Christmas. I beat you to it. Yeah. Merry Christmas and welcome to this week's episode of Cheeky Tales. It's a Christmas special. Christmas special. It's what? How many many days to Christmas? How many is it? Seven days till Christmas. When the episode comes out. We had two people just tell us. (laughs) When the episode comes out. Oh. First fact check of the day. Five days till Christmas. Five days till Christmas. Oh, five. Okay. (laughs) The fact fact checker has got- The first fact checker The fact checker has got his first First fact fact checker is wrong. I'm sorry. (laughs) Please edit that out. (laughs) Seven days, actual five days- Of recording. Five five days from when- Five days from when this comes out. Seven days from recording. Yep. Wow. So you you have heard the voice. Uh, That is- That is Sean- uh, you recognise him from previous episodes, uh, one of which is the second most popular of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, that was Ned Kelly, wasn't it? Uh, no, the Piper. Oh, yeah, that was during Mad Sean. Piper, you, another another war story during Sean Vemba. That's right, mm-hmm. Sean Vemba. Um, yeah, Sean has joined us this week uh, as a fact checker. He's our producer this week. Yeah, th- I think we mentioned it last week, didn't we? We talked about it. We did, yes. and we got one application, and it was Sean. <laughs> I mean, realistically, I the amount of times I find myself sitting in my car with headphones on on my bike, screaming <laughs> at my phone about words being pronounced wrong, such as- the, That'll never change. The Halley, okay, such as Halley's Comet. And when you've got, a, you've got to play license-free jazz or funk while you fact yep. check things. So uh, The license-free jazz, uh, that was for John spilling beers. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, I was in the area and I'm a nuisance. <laughs> Speaking of that, can I have a beer? Can we christen the new house? You can have a beer. You can have a beer no, on I, the on the wood. It was no, it's fine. I was, I was just joking. I was talking about christening the new house with because spillage. You're not allowed on this couch to have a oh, beer. Okay. Well, the sippy cup was the out last cup. night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a party last night, and at one point, the sippy cup came out. <laughs> well, speaking of the party last night, let's just uh, have a cheeky tales. Happy birthday, boy! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I am turning thirty. Officially old. I'm an old man. I'm the last of the hip, three. Hip, hip. <sighs> Great inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm the last of the people that I went to school with to turn 30, uh, at least in my grade. So uh, that's good. I'm an old man. Rachel! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the live recording of Cheeky Tales. If Rachel makes a noise, that's the first time we've had five people on a podcast. Mm, true. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a true holiday special with people just coming in and out. Yep. It's like those live TV Christmas specials. Yeah, you know like my, an my episode favorite, of Cheers. My favorite thing about Sean fact checking is that you can see very clearly as he goes to pick up the <laughs> microphone, you get like a three second warning. <laughs> there he goes again. <laughs> of course, so the listeners are aware. I don't have a mic stand. Uh, my, yeah, Sean, my microphone is placed on a tea towel. <laughs> it took a uh, how long? How many episodes till I bought the stands for us? I think it was twenty. So you got to be on while. twenty episodes yeah. before you get a mic stand. Ah, <laughs> you're, at, you're at four. <laughs> it will be a while. <laughs> if you haven't guessed it yet, which I'm sure you have, this week's episode is the seasonal episode. Yep, John has managed to wrangle himself a seasonal episode <laughs> again. He loves doing. Love it. it. And it is, of course, about the Christmas truce of 1914. Yes, which took place during World War One. I believe this is our first World War One story. It might well be. It might be. Yeah, I think I'm, we've mentioned World War One a few. We times. have, but I believe this is our first foray into it. Was the Olympic in World War One, or was that World War Two? No, the Olympic got converted in World War One to be a. No, that was two. Never mind. Never mind. Which Olympic? Are we the doing? RMS Olympic. Oh, okay. Sister of the Titanic. Oh right, yes. not the actual Olympics. No, not the Olympics. The Olympic. Right. Anyway, we've had a couple from World War II, which we just mentioned, Sean's, the Mad Piper of D-Day. And we've had, obviously, the Battle of Midway. Yep. But let's have a quick background to the Great War. The 
War to End All Wars, they preemptively called it. Yep, which didn't <laughs> age real well, did it? No, it did not. Just 20 <laughs> years later. Pretty much the war to start all wars. Yeah. Well, I mean, not really, because it was kind of- I'm sure John will get into it, but it's off the back of a lot of other stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a big build-up. Yeah. So, the prelude to World War I goes all the, back, all the way back to 1848. Wow. So almost like 100 years. Is that Napoleon's previous. time? Sean, is that, when was Napoleon around? I don't when know. When was Napoleon? <clears throat> Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, born 1769, died 1821, later known by his nice. regnal name of Napoleon I, was a French military commander and political leader who rose to prominence during the French Revolution and led successful campaigns during the Revolutionary Wars. He was the de facto leader of the French Republic from 1799 to 1804, and then the Emperor of France from 1804 until 1814, and then again in 1815. So this is post- Napoleonic. Okay. So, uh, back in 1848, with the balance of power in Europe starting to change. Yep. Britain would go into splendid isolation. Splendid isolation. Mm -hmm. A term given to British politics in which they would avoid permanent allies. Okay. So, they just went, we're not going to make any permanent alliances. Uh, We're just going to be over here by ourselves. That seems like a a really risky choice Mm. for a country. Uh, This- era would also uh, see the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Oh, not the Turks. Yeah, and the rise of Prussia under Otto von Bismarck. Mm. There were many, many more political moves, alliances made, and smaller wars fought, which all increased tensions in Europe, most of which centred around the Balkans. Okay. Uh, the Balkans. Yep. Do you know what I'm referring to as the Balkans? Isn't the Balkans like the islands around like Norway and stuff? No. No, it's, I believe it's like the southern peninsula of Europe. So, it's not an actual oh, country. It's okay. like a collection of those c- So, like countries. Portugal and the bottom of Spain and all that or? Um, I think it's more like Serbia, Bosnia. Oh. No? If you imagine yourself looking at a map of Europe and you can see Spain on the left-hand side. I like that you didn't say imagine a map of Europe. It was imagine yourself looking <laughs> at a map of Europe. Okay, I'm picturing third person myself looking at a map. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> anyway, imagine a map of Europe and you're looking at Italy as the boot. To yep. the right of Italy is a large peninsula. That's the Balkan okay. region. Which right. is the, that peninsula which separates yep. Europe from Asia. And current day countries that make up that area is? Current day countries that make up that region. Ooh, where were we? I think I was right in saying like- I'm going to say the Czech Republic. Croatia. It was originally the Kingdom of Yugoslavia in the earlier 20th century, earlier 20th century- Bulgaria is the largest area and the highest point. Current regions, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Serbia, Croatia, Armenia, Romania. Yeah. All those, kind of, all those yeah. kind of countries. So, okay. there's lots of tension yeah. in those areas. I'm with you now. And Greece. Uh, Greece. One of these alliances of note was the Triple Alliance, uh, an alliance between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Yep. Uh, with the purpose of that alliance was to isolate France as France had an agreement with Britain at the time. So strange. The two countries that hate each other. Yeah. Honest, honestly, boy, there could be weeks and weeks of research into all the political movements and secret yeah. treaties and all that kind of stuff that happened in the late 19th century mm. in this area and like this collection of countries. It's just- Wild. It's wild. There's so, so much. If you're, if you're actually interested, just Google- If there's one thing that gets me interested, it's- Late nineteenth century politics. It is, yeah. Google prelude <laughs> to World War One. There's so many things. Yeah, I'm sure there's a bunch of docos on it too. Mm. There was also a bit of an arms race that happened uh, mm. between the Imperial German Navy and the British Royal Navy. Yep. Uh, which all came to an end in 1906 when the British launched the HMS Dreadnought. Oh, that's where the term comes from. Yes, a ship mm. that revolutionised naval combat and was such an inva- advancement in naval technology. Her name became associated with a whole class of battleships. The Dreadnought. The Dreadnoughts, correct. Uh, And then after the Dreadnoughts came, I I did a bit of research into this, came Super Dreadnoughts. Great name. Uh, And then after that again was the class of which the Bismarck and the Trippants were a part of, which were like fast battleships. Again, they were another class above that. Right. Class above. I didn't didn't go into what class a Dreadnought. I think it was like six main guns or something along those lines with a heavy play. Whatever. Early 20th century saw multiple conflicts in the Balkans. Uh, the Bosnian crisis began in 1908, and that saw Hungary, uh, Austra- 
the Bosnian crisis began in 1908, and that saw Austria-Hungary annex Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay. That's a place I've never heard of. I probably Herzegovina. Thank you. Herzegovina. I have YouTubed pronunciations, and I've also forgotten them because we've had a big day today. <laughs> we have had a big day. We'll get into that at the end. Uh, so, yeah, that annexed those countries, uh, t- uh, and they were territories within the Ottoman Empire. Ottos. 1912 and 1913 was the first Balkans War. Mm-hmm. Uh, that saw an alliance of Serbia, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and Greece, known as the Balkan League, quickly overrun most of European Turkey. Okay. So, those three countries just- European Turkey, European as opposed to Turkey. Asian Turkey? Yes. Okay. The Treaty of London was created in 1913 at the end of that, and it right. dealt with the territorial adjustments arising from the end of the First Balkan War. Okay. Uh, it, that also created independent Albia. Albia. Uh, Albania. Sorry, okay. Albania. All right, Albania. Yep. This is also something else that's very interesting, having to look at all the territory adjustments after- Yeah, well, like even World War I well, created before World War changed I, a whole bunch of- And then after, yeah, World, yeah it's ridiculous. And all those- Territory adjustments also kind of impacted like World War One, Yeah. And then after, the ones after World War One impacted- World War Two. World War Two. Mm. However, uh, the, dis- the disputes among the victors sparked the 33-day-long Second Balkan War. Okay. 33 days. That's yes. a short war. That is a short war. Uh, this is when Bulgaria attacked Serbia and Greece. Right. Bulgaria lost, losing territory to Serbia and Greece, as well as Romania. This caused a mix of resentment, nationalism, and insecurity as some of the countries, they felt cheated out of their rightful gains following the first Balkan War. Rightful gains. Yeah, well, they kind of like defeated yeah. the things and whatever, and they wanted- Yeah, you know, I get it. And because of this, this area became known as the powder keg of Europe. Mm. It was very in- instable. and Just was, anything could happen in there. Yes, correct. And something did happen there on June 28th, 1914. The shot heard throughout the world. Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the heir to Emperor Franz Joseph, visit Sarajevo. 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 Fact checker is failing us. Pronunciation: Sarajevo. Sarajevo. There we go. Six assassins from the Young Bosnia movement mm-hmm. took up positions along the route to be taken, like the route that the Archduke's motorcade yep. was going to take. Their hope was- I love this story. Do you? I love this story. Yep. Do you know it? Yeah. Okay. I know what happened. Their hope was that with the Archduke's death, it would free Bosnia from Austrian control. Yeah. There was no certainty that that would happen. Mm. It was just, let's shoot him, see what happens. One of the assassins threw a grenade at the car. Yep. uh, And injured two of the Archduke's aides. Mm. They were taken to hospital and the convoy carried on. Further attempts along the route were unsuccessful, but an hour later when returning from visiting the injured aides, mm-hmm. uh, the Archduke's car took a wrong turn into a street where Gavrilo Princip was standing. Just to be clear, completely unplanned that they turned unplanned. down this road and it un- also unplanned that this person was, was there. Standing there, yep. Yeah. He stepped forward and fired two pistol shots, fatally wounding Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. Yeah. Just- so just completely unlike, like took they attempted turn. so many things to kill him, yep. failed every time, and then they just so happen to take a wrong turn, and here's the guy and just shoots him. Yep, just shoots so him. just like, oh no, like Batman's <laughs> parents in the whoopsies. In the, alley. <laughs> the result, well, although Emperor, Fran- how do you think that guy felt when he turned around and saw the friend, like the saw guy in the trunk? He's yeah. like, oh crap, yeah. <laughs> get the gun. <laughs> it's fumbling. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, no, nah, great play by me, wasn't it, guys? Yep. <laughs> I totally planned that. Calculated. The result, well, it, um, although Emperor Franz Joseph was shocked, the two men were not close and he didn't really care. <sighs> Nor did the people of Vienna. <laughs> uh, so everyone's like, oh, whatever. Uh, Vienna is the capital of Austria. I Vienne. Believe. Sure. Sean says yes. Uh, it's recorded on <laughs> that day and the next <laughs> like, day. Can we now say something and then both <laughs> look at Sean? <laughs> it's, it's recorded that on- also, just a small fact, Franz Joseph was not shot. Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke of Austria, was shot. That's what we said. That's what I said. You said Franz Joseph was shot. Nope. No. He said that Franz Ferdinand was the heir to Franz, Franz Joseph. Joseph. Yes. And never mind. You, this is not working. 
Because you're not listening. When I go back to edit this, I'll hear what happened. Uh, and, you know, either Sean's vindicated or you're vindicated. Yeah, doesn't matter. Uh, the pe- Again, the people of the unit, they didn't really care either. So on the day of the incident and the next day, it's recorded of people listening to music and drank wine in the streets as if nothing had happened. Imagine that, like looking back now. So I don't believe they're related. Is it just like, was he elected next and was waiting to take? No, they must be, ele- they must be related, right? But they weren't close. Like, I don't. Franz Ferdinand was the eldest son of Archduke Karl Ludwig of Austria, and he was the younger brother of Emperor, Emperor Franz Joseph oh, I of Austria. There you go. But yeah, it still said that they weren't close. And yeah, so your, brother, your brother's just been assassinated. You're just like, whatevs. So historians do note that the impact of this murder was significant. Yeah. Um, likening it to 9-11. Okay. Well, in sense that it was a terrorist event that- Yeah. But I mean, nobody- it's not like after 9 11, no. people just sat around and had coffees for two days. No. But it was saying that the impact was hist- like it was charged with historical meaning. Right. It, okay. It transformed the political history in Vienna going okay. forward. Sure. There was also further violence in Sarajevo. Authorities encouraged anti Serb riots, which Bosnian Croats and Bosniaks killed two Bosnian Serbs. This is also very complicated for different. Regions of people in yeah. the same country coming from right, and they were, you know, like I said, they're called Bosnian Croats, Bosniaks, Bosnian Serbs. Um, so yeah, these two Bosnian Serbs were killed, and then these other people went on to damage multiple Serb built Serb owned buildings. Okay, Austro Hungarian authorities also imprisoned, imprisoned and extradited 5,500 prominent Serbs. 700 to 2,200 of whom died in prison and a further 460 Serbs were sentenced to death. Wow. So there's lots of, I guess, racial yeah. tension happening in this area. It's actually a really fantastic map um, that you can see the, the ethnic diversity of that area, of the Bosnian Herzegovina region, mm. how you can see how it all overlaps and how messy it is. It's I'm sure we will have that on the socials come a release day. Yes, that is, I have seen that map. Yeah. Oh, I have, <laughs> I, I have seen that map. That's what I was looking at. So on July 23rd, Austria delivered an ultimatum to Serbia, listing 10 demands made intentionally unacceptable to provide an excuse for starting hostilities. They pretty much gave them like these Brilliant 10 list of things idea. and went, well, they're not going to comply to all of them. Serbia then ordered a general mobilization on the 25th of July, uh, but accepted all the terms. Uh, apart from a few. There was a few that were like um, suppressing agents into investigating the the murder and stuff like that. Was a few, okay. And they were just like, no, we don't really want to do that. Yeah. They pretty much accepted everything except for like- Right. So they just wanted to check into it. Yeah. And they were like, no, we don't want you to suppress our dudes who are investigating yeah. this thing. And they're like, no, whatever. But they also mobilized their army. Oh, okay. So they're like- Cool. We accept all this. Also, war, please. Well, they haven't declared war yet. They've just mobilized the army. Claiming this as a rejection, Austria broke off the diplomatic relations and ordered partial mobilization on July 28th. They did declare war on Serbia and began shelling Belgrade. Okay. Russia mobilized in support of Serbia on Mm -hmm. the 30th, 30th of July. Is Russia, is, is Serbia part of Russia? No. Is it now? It was part of the USSR, though. Yeah, it was. So, Serbia is located underneath Hungary. It's kind of on the opposite side of the Balkans to Russia. So, right. Russia kind of curls around, and then it's Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia. Isn't then, Serbia you know, the Russia. super cold place? Yes. No, that's Siberia. Siberia. That's the one. I'm that's thinking, thinking the Siberia. Side of the country. I'm thinking Siberia. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So, Russia is supporting Serbia. Germany would then request France to stay neutral, which they declined. <laughs> Uh, could you stay out of this? No. no. <laughs> uh, and, f- and France ordered their army That's to such mobilize. That's a French thing to yeah. do too. No. no. Uh, but so they ordered their army to mobilize, but they held off of declaring war. Okay. Yeah. Belgium would announce its neutrality. Belgium's a country that I would never imagine declaring war. It's it's always just been like, we're, out, we're staying out of this. Yeah, like Switzerland. Switzerland has like specifically designed their country to not be part of war. There's a fascinating video on YouTube about uh, uh, how uh, Switzerland uh, is designed to be incredibly defendable. Yeah. 
But yeah. aren't they also the one that have mandatory service? subscription yes. service? And every household owns a gun, like yes. has a mil- like a mm. provided yeah. firearm. Yeah, they- uh, I don't know about that bit, but yeah, they are incredibly like their their military is usually um, incredibly powerful, but they mm. don't use them. I, I believe, and Sean will fact check this. I believe every household is issued a firearm because it's always the Americans' defense of like gun violence. Like, oh, Switzerland has more guns per household than we do. They I think have no Canada gun- has more guns than they have the no US gun do. violence. Yeah. It's not an argument. Anyway, we're not going to talk about American gun politics because it's stupid. And of course, you shouldn't have automatic weapons in schools. Stupid. But yes, let's go on. So yeah, like I said, Belgium has announced its neutrality. Britain would ask France and Germany to respect that, to which France would agree. But um, Britain would not get a response from Germany. Germany Ah. just kind of went, yeah, we're not. Right. They didn't say no. They just didn't respond. Okay. I feel like in this sort of situation, that is a no. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have an a answer for us, Sean? Most of this has to do with Belgium when it comes to Britain. So they had obligations to Belgium, and then that was where the complication came in because they were neutral. They didn't really have the same kind of obligations. So the British cabinet narrowly decided its obligations to Belgium under the Treaty of 1839 of London did not require it to oppose a German you invasion. Stop you want me to stop him? Voice. We were asking about guns and Swiss houses. Oh, guns and stuff. <laughs> Does is every it, is Swiss household have to have a gun? Swiss household or Belgian households? Swiss. 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 I believe it. Do yeah. the Swiss get offered a gun? I believe they get told to have one in their yeah. house. And I know, all, I know all that what Sean was saying, but I kind of left that out because I didn't want to get too deep in the weeds. As a Swiss citizen, you are generally permitted to own a weapon if you're at least 18 years old. You are not subject to a general deputy ship or are represented through a care appointee. There is no such reason to believe you may use the weapon to harm yourself or others. So it's really kind of loose. Okay. Has a stunningly high rate of gun ownership. Yeah, right. There you go. Yeah. It hasn't and had a mass somehow shooting. They don't have mass shootings in schools. In 21 years. Mm. They haven't had a mass shooting in 21 years mm. where a man stormed the local parliament and Zug, killing 14 people and then killed himself. It has 2 million privately owned guns in a nation of 8.3 million people. Wow. In One saying, four in, people has a gun. In saying that, let's just pause for a moment. And do we want to offer condolences to the family members of the Queensland Police Service? Yeah. Members who lost their lives this week, speaking of gun violence. Yeah. Um, what a wild event. Terrible segue, but yeah. we just officially at Cheeky Towers offer condolences to those families and we will su- offer support to the men and women serving in the blue line to- uh, the thin blue line. Thin blue line to mm. protect their communities around Queensland. Yep. Thank you. Terrible tragedy. Um, but it, it was actually really good at the cricket yesterday, what they did before. Yeah. That was lovely. Play, so. mm. Moving back to the story. Oh, Sean's blown <laughs> away by something unrelated. Sean has discovered something incredible. Oh, Sean has discovered so much more about <laughs> Swedish gun laws. So, Zurich's <laughs> Nabashison is a traditional annual festival that dates back to the 1600s. Roughly translates to boys shooting. Uh, it's a <laughs> it's a youth rifle competition for children between the ages of 13 and 17. Uh, <laughs> where they, teenage girls have been allowed to compete as well since 1991, where the kids of the country flock to the, competi- the competition every September to compete in target shooting using Swiss Army service rifles. They're proud to show off how well they can shoot. It values accuracy above all else, and officials crown a Schutzenkönig, or king or queen of marksmen, based on the results. Like the prime king. But I shooting. wish, I wish I could have been a Schutzen king. <laughs> yeah, Schutzenkönig. Schutzenkönig. And, and funnily enough, having an armed citizenry citizenry is what they say has helped keep the Swiss neutral for 200 years. Yeah, because they haven't ever been invaded. It's armed neutrality. Yeah. Yeah, right. Speaking wow. speaking of being good shots, uh, I don't know if you're able to confirm or deny this, Sean, being that you were an ex-serviceman or yes. whatever, and we're in World War I. I've mm-hmm. always heard the story that the Axis soldiers, like the Germans, were told to surrender to the troops in shorts because they were Australians and they were a good shot, being that at that time, most people were on farms and knew how to shoot because being farm workers and that was part of working on a farm. I have never heard anything to that sort of tale, but as a small thing, they have talked about why a lot of people failed to shoot and that was they practiced shooting at round targets rather than shooting at targets shaped like people, which is why they switched to using targets shaped like humans because huh. when you had conscription and you had people simply coming out of the woodwork to fight because they had to, and they weren't trained at aiming their weapon at a person. They aimed it at a round mm. target, and they found that people were then more hesitant to shoot. Yeah. There you go. 
Okay, back to the tale. Germany would plan to attack France through Belgium, and France would become aware of this. So French Commander-in-Chief Joseph Joffre would ask permission to enter Belgium to preempt that move. He was told no, because that would avoid the violation of Belgium's neutrality, and any advance would only come if Germany invaded the border. However, French and German forces would exchange fire on August 3rd at Luxembourg, to which Germany would declare war on France. Early morning on August 4th, Germany did invade Belgian borders and Britain would send Germany an ultimatum demanding Germany withdraw. That expired at midnight with no response. And then the two empires were at war. I guess this would be the official start of yeah. World War So that's the I. moment. Yep. Off we go. Gas it mask on, boys. Off. Men would Where are we be, dropping? Yeah, men would be sent to foreign <laughs> countries with the promise that the war will be over and you'll be home by Christmas. Yeah. Something- And they all went off like, oh, it's going to be great fun. Something I think was repeated in World War II. Yes. Off you go, boys. We'll yep. be home by Christmas. Mm-hmm. That did not happen. No, it did not. It was not a fun time. No, it was an awful time. Yeah. World War I would see the start of trench warfare. Mm, trench foot. No, yeah, trench foot. No <laughs> longer would men stand in open fields with no cover and continuously fire at each other until one side ran. Yep. Referring to Civil War where stupid tactics of standing yep. in open field shooting guns at each other. Now they'll hide in little holes that they all dug. Not so much holes. That, that was yeah. more of a World War II thing. But instead they would find it better to drink, uh, to drink, to dig trenches yep. and have some kind of cover from incoming bullets. During the first eight weeks, French and British troops would halt the German attack through Belgium and Germany would fall back dig- digging in at the Assigne Valley. It was World War II where France built like the giant defensive line that had a gap at the end, right? Never heard of that. France built this like massive defensive line like to stop Germany ever invading them again. Yeah, right. Um, but they built it th- with a gap at the end. So and they, they just, just went, went around it. Yeah. yeah. That, that does sound like a World War II thing. The Maginot line. That's or Ligne Magano, however you pronounce that in French, yep. I'm not very good at speaking French, uh, is a line of concrete fortifications, obstacles, and weapon installations built by France in the 1930s to deter yep. invasion by Germany so it was bef- and force them to move around the fortifications. So it was built after yep. World War One And before World War Two, And before World War II. Yeah, right. yeah. It was impervious to most forms of attack, and in consequence, the Germans invaded through low countries in 1940, passing it to the north. Yeah, it didn't really stop them at all. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, I believe it wasn't completed or wasn't built all the way around, which was the yeah. problem. So the Germans have fallen back and they've dug in at Assane Valley. The Allies, the French and the British, would counterattack but be repulsed and both sides would begin digging trenches. Mm. The following would be called the Race to the Sea, in which each side digging more trenches and trying to outflank the other would just keep trying to outflank and keep moving up. Yeah. By November, the armies had built a continuous line of trenches running from the North Sea to the Swiss frontier, roughly 640 kilometres long. This was the Western Front. Right. Okay. So I've was, actually never had that explained to me, like what the Western Front was. No, it was pretty much just a continuous line of trenches yeah. from the North Sea down to- Yeah. There you guess, go. Yeah. It, yeah. 640 kilometres long. So that's the backstory of World War I. <laughs> how, okay. far, how far are we into it? We are 32 minutes into recording. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> the Christmas. episode's going to be done in 45 minutes. Christmas. <laughs> Christmas. Fraternization, peaceful and friendly interactions between opposing forces wasn't that uncommon early in the war, especially along quiet sections of the Western Front. Both sides would abstain from aggressive behaviour, while others, uh, while other cases would extend to regular conversations and even visits from one trench to another. Just, po- I'm just going to pop over to the British yeah. uh, for a minute. I'll, I'm yeah. just going to go chat to them Pretty for a much. while. Pretty much. It would also happen on the Eastern Front with the Austro-Hungarian and Russian forces, but was a lot less common. That is really strange, isn't it? It speaks to like that- Era? It really speaks to that disconnect that used to exist between ruling and- the people, like the people that made the decisions had a completely different agenda to the people that had to follow through on those. I guess I guess at this time, really, when you got to think about it too, is so you got the Western Front, which is mainly like British and French and yeah. German. It was a lot of British and German fraternization. Yeah. And I guess at that point in history, they didn't really have any reason to hate each other. 
Yeah. Um, and early on in the war, they're just, they're just, the, the men were literally just following orders. So there was yeah. no animosity. They were just there following orders, yeah. doing what they were told. But like, it's just so weird to think like you might go over and chat to these people that you know at some point you're going to have to shoot and kill. Or they're, they're shooting and trying to kill yeah. you. Yeah. It's or so charge weird. out with a knife at the end yeah. of the gun. So truce, truces between British and German forces can be dated back to early November. And by December 1st, a British soldier recorded a German sergeant popping in one morning to see how they were getting on. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, French and German units were generally more tense with each other because they've had history. Yeah. Uh, but the same phenomenon began to emerge. In early December... A German surgeon recorded a regular half hourly truce each evening to recover dead soldiers, during which the French and German soldiers would even exchange newspapers. What? They would exchange newspapers with each other. That's odd. Bad weather and trench flooding would also cause a cease to hostilities and would last until the weather would clear. So when like the trenches would start flooding, yeah. like, where they would stop trying to heal each other and just, I guess, move rations and stuff. Yeah, like, okay, we're fighting the weather enough. Yeah. Yeah, odd. So odd to and think the, about. And there's also the each evening and a half hour to go out and collect. Yeah, dead bodies. Or dead bodies to bring them back for burial. and That one makes sense to me because it's like, well, this is just humanity. Yeah. These trenches would be so close to each other, it was very easy for soldiers to shout greetings at each other. <laughs> Morning, friends. <laughs> you know that, um, that video? Hey, what's your name? Have you seen that one? I don't know what you're talking about. You haven't, you haven't seen that one? No. We're like, oh, what's your name? Ben, what's your name? Steve. You, Steve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what? Fuck. Yeah, that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, many German soldiers had actually lived in England. Uh, so there was that common language. Yep. Uh, and the Germans would often ask about news from local football leagues or soccer leagues. Nice. While other conversations would just be about the weather or messages from sweethearts. So like, <laughs> the, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I've got this letter from my girlfriend back home or whatever like that. The, the early 1910s equivalent of sharing nudes. <laughs> <laughs> Music was also common in peaceful sectors. Units would often sing in the evenings, sometimes deliberately pointed at the enemy for entertainment <laughs> or like a um, gentle taunting. Gentle, gentle, though. Gentle taunting, like a bit of, um, what do we call it? Um, I've, I've completely lost the word for it. Heckling. Oh, <laughs> Just a bit of a gentle heckle against the other guy. Hey, How you- many Germans does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know the end of that joke, yeah, but you know, know that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. Oh, you Germans can't shoot. <laughs> oh, why, why are we heckling Germans in a German accent? <laughs> oh, <laughs> we've well, <you're> forgotten. we <laughs> have forgotten who's here. Who. <laughs> who's, who's fighting who? Early December, Sir Edward Huls of the Scots Guard wrote that he was planning on, to organise a concert for Christmas Day. Okay. Christmas Day, 1914. It started with the Germans placing candles along their trenches and, cr- and on Christmas trees they had set up along the trenches. They also started singing carols. The British would respond by singing carols of their own. Cute. It then escalated to both sides, shouting Christmas greetings at each other. Soon after, there were trips across no man's land where small gifts were exchanged. Gifts such as food, tobacco, alcohol and souvenirs. As I said in the opening, the artillery guns went silent and all that was heard was Christmas carols. It's so weird. It's, like, it's strange. It's, yeah. It's like, so different to what you think of war as being. Mm, that, like I said, it was a phenomenon that just happened. Of, I, it just, again, it just, didn't it just shows the like, we don't know what we're fighting for or like we're yeah. not invested in what we're fighting for. True. This informal ceasefire also allowed killed soldiers to be brought back behind the lines for burial again. Uh, and in many sector, sectors along the front, the truce lasted through Christmas night and in other sectors, continued to New Year's Day, which is quite a long time. That is, yeah, that's a week. That's a week. Yeah, Sean, is like, is this a thing in the army now where they'll like try and get you invested in why you're fighting? To a point, yeah. But it starts yeah. with access to information. Yeah. Like these guys didn't get told diddly. They really didn't know. Yeah, they just got. They signed didn't necessarily up. know what was going on. This is also in a world that's a lot bigger. Like. They don't know as much information about what's around yeah. them. They're not only are they in a foreign place that look. Did you just clap? <laughs> oh, let me just be quiet. Oh, bang. <laughs> it was a Mentos. It was a Mentos. <laughs> this is Cheeky Tales Live. <laughs> oh 
live and unedited. <laughs> live and free from Aaron's Lounge Room. <laughs> It's not free if you want to sponsor us. Please sponsor us. Yeah, it would. Uh, I'd actually really like if it wasn't free. <laughs> Need like an intro guy like on Fallon. It's like coming to you live from 55 Broadway Avenue, New York City. Yeah, this is just Cheeky docks Tales. Aaron. Yeah, giving docks his address my house. Out. Yeah. Um, no, it, it comes from a lack of information and then subsequently more information. You become more invested or less invested in what's going on. So these guys didn't really know anything. There wasn't common for them to have radios or anything that would allow them to understand what's happening around them. And they were in a place that they might have never even been before, but is still somehow so close to where they come from. So there is intrinsically, there's more smaller connections connecting them all together. So you look at more recent conflicts in the Western world, they're lands that are very, very, very far away, separated by oceans versus this is Europe. Like even if they've never been to Europe before and they're from England- They've heard about it. They've met, like there could be, think about like the process of how any sort of- um, well, like John said, Germans had lived in Yeah, Germans had lived in thing, and they might have a brother who is English or they might yeah. have a cousin that's French. I mean, look at the royal family, how they were all connected yeah. together. Like there was so many more smaller connections versus flying halfway around the world to a third world nation or a developing yeah. nation that you've never got any connection with. Your question also reminded me of Starship Troopers. You know, when they're doing the propaganda, like the sure. bugs have done this. Would you like to know more? And you click on it. Yeah. They're disgusting creatures that, you know, shoot plasma off and whatever. Right. Right. One welcome our new insect overlords, of course. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> continuing me, on the deep. Do Simpsons not tell cuts. me you have not seen Starship Troopers. Um, I won't tell you then. He hasn't seen Starship Troopers. What? Like, I, at what point are you not going to be surprised when I say no? I haven't seen a movie. Yeah, this is. So you have no idea what I just said. No, he hasn't seen Starship. Troopers. I just nodded along <laughs> politely. I'll add it to the list. Just so listeners are aware, he is actually getting out his phone and adding it to I his just, imaginary list. It's not imaginary. It's what it's right here. I need to watch Tenant. I need to watch Inception again. I need to watch The Matrix. Oh, there's so many more ones on there that John's brought up. Yeah, I've only just started adding the ones from this episode from this podcast. Anyway, um, so I have some stories from soldiers when they wrote letters. One story from Brigadier General Walter Congreve, commander of the 18th Infantry Brigade, recalled the Germans declaring a truce for the day. One of his men bravely lifted his head above the parapet and. Others from both sides walked into no man's land. Uh, if you don't want, don't know what no man's land is, it's kind of like the land in between the trenches where it's called no man's land because you don't want to be there. Like mm-hmm. usual fighting, there's lots. And of, no one owns it. Yeah, well, lots of bullets and yeah. stuff coming through. Officers and men shook hands and exchanged cigarettes and cigars. One of his captains smoked a cigar with the best shot in the German army, whom was no more than 18 years old. Wow. He also admitted that he was reluctant to join for fear of German snipers. The English person was. Yes. Right. Uh, Brigadier General Walter Congreve. Hmm. Bruce. Oh, my God. Why? Or Marty? Why? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've added this person and I actually haven't read his last name. Amazing. Barnes' ba- father. Ban's father. Ban's father. Thank you. Bruce wow. Ban's father. Look at that. The fact check is ahead of you. Yeah, because he's reading it off the Wikipedia page <laughs> where I got my information from. <laughs> Just to confirm, I have eight different tabs open with various <laughs> different stories about the Christmas truce, just so that I'm all on board and I don't have to go every single time. <laughs> so what was it? Bruce ba- Brand's father. Ban's father. Ban's father. Band. Who fought throughout the war, wrote, and I have copied this from Wikipedia if everyone wants to know, because this is a direct quote. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have missed that unique and weird Christmas day for anything. Yep. I spotted a German officer, some sort of a lieutenant, I think, and being a bit of a collector, I intimidated him. I inti- what? Intimated? Intimated, yeah. Intimated. That's not the word I would have used. To him that I had taken a fancy to some of his buttons. Oh, he probably couldn't speak English. Yeah. So he's like- Gestured. Yeah. Is probably the better word I should have used. Yeah. I brought out my wire clippers and with a few deft snips, removed a couple of his buttons and put them in my pocket. I then gave him two of mine in exchange. The last I saw was one of my machine gunners who was a bit of an amateur hairdresser in civilian life, cutting the unnaturally long hair of a docile botch. Is that the right word, Sean? Botch. I guess it's slang for German. Sean is deeply invested now. He's hearing about Um, army-related hairdressers. Who was patiently kneeling on the ground whilst the automatic clippers crept up the back of his neck. Yes, I did include that one, Sean, because I thought you would find that interesting. Bock or Bosch was a derogatory and informal word specifically designed for a German soldier. There you go. So was that was that the word before Jerry? Because that's what was used in World War II. Wars, yes. Yeah. 
Henry Williamson, a 19-year-old private in the London Rifle Brigade, wrote to his mother on Boxing Day. Dear mother, I am writing from the trenches. It is 11 o'clock in the morning. Beside me is a coke fire. John, can you look up what a coke fire is? Lord. Oppo- <laughs> opposite me, a dugout, wet, with straw in it. Mm-hmm. The ground is sloppy in the actual trench, but frozen elsewhere. In my mouth is a pipe presented by the Princess Mary. In the pipe is tobacco. Of course, you say. But wait, in the pipe is German tobacco. Ha <laughs> ha, you say. From a German prisoner or found in a captured trench? Oh dear, no. From a German soldier. Yes, a live German soldier from his own trench. Yesterday, the British and Germans met and shook hands in the ground between the trenches and exchanged souvenirs and shook hands. Yes, all day, Christmas Day. And as I write, marvellous, isn't it? Marvellous. Marvellous, isn't it? Marvellous. They were really taken aback by what happened. Yeah, because it would be so weird. It is. It's very weird. How often do you reckon in history this happened where- I know how they often- They would stop fighting. I know what how often this happened in history. Yeah. It really didn't happen again. Yeah. Coke fire. Coke. <clears throat> is a grey, hard and porous coal-based fuel with a high carbon content and few impurities made by heating coal or oil in the absence of air, a destructive distillation process. It is important in the industrial world, used mainly in iron ore smelting, but also as a fuel in stoves and forges or when air pollution is a concern. So they were able to burn the coke as a fuel source and it doesn't produce too much smoke. There you but go. There are many other letters written yeah. home documenting these stories of the Christmas Day truce. Um, if you want to get on the Wikipedia page, I encourage you to and read them because it's just like what, the one I just wrote out. Like, Not that we just use Wikipedia for our research. No, no, I've used other pages. But this Wikipedia was a very good source for this It for always this is. <laughs> oh, is that what the sideways glances were for? Because I what? always <laughs> use Wikipedia in every episode I write. Uh, including this little snippet from, so uh, another letter from a German lieutenant. Mm-hmm. I did look up this. Johannes Niemann. Johannes. I don't think it's Johannes. <laughs> I didn't say Johannes. Johannes. Johannes Niemann. Johannes Niemus. Johannes. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> he wrote. <laughs> that was- <laughs> did I say Johannes? You said Johannes. I, I thought I said jo- Johannes. Nope. <laughs> oh, Lord. This is the NC-17 Cheeky Tales episode. <laughs> Johannes. Johannes Niemann. Yeah. <laughs> he Johannes wrote. Johannes Niemann. Whatever. Join us. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Grabbed my binoculars and looking cautiously over the parapet, I saw the incredible sight of our soldiers exchanging cigarettes, schnapps and chocolates with the enemy. Schnapps. I mean, I'd take some German schnapps in the middle of World War One <laughs> And German chocolate. Yeah. It was probably- uh, Belgian is the one that makes good chocolate. Yeah, but they just come through Belgium. Belgium. So. <laughs> If your options are German chocolate and schnapps or friggin' bully beef, I'm pretty sure I know what I'd want to pick. Yep. Bully beef is about to come up, actually. Yes. Uh, there were <laughs> there were people who opposed the truth on both sides, including General Sir Horace Smith Dorian. He issued orders forbidding friendly communication with the enemy and one corporal from the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry, Adolf Hitler, also expressed e- his opposition. Yep. What are you Mr. Mustache himself. Because Hitler's getting brought up. Oh, yeah. This is not the first time he's been mentioned a few times, hasn't he? There was yeah, the, we talk about Hitler a bit. In the Olympic episode, we actually had video yep. of him, which was so strange still. Yeah. There's also many reports, although some historians dispute it, of football matches being played, potentially up to 29 different reports from different Wait, sec- sections. this is disputed? Yes. I've always heard that this is just fact. It is believed there were but not as many or as oh, okay. how it was described because right. they say if it was to take place in no man's land like the ground's very uneven and yeah how can you play soccer in places that have had like artillery yeah. divots yeah. and stuff like that some were between like and it would also say that the football matches were taken uh like play between troops of the same side oh okay and not so necessarily like british troops with british troops. Yeah. okay yeah but there are stories of british and germans playing yeah. soccer against each other. I feel like I've seen photos of this. Is that a, is that a false memory? There might be a false memory. Okay. Uh, there is one story that actually had a soccer ball. So apparently someone brought a soccer ball up to the front. Yeah. Um, but most of the stories were actually done with like soccer was played with makeshift soccer balls, mainly from bully beef tins. Bully beef. And I'm assuming a bully beef is just like a brand of beef. You would think so. Yeah. Sean says yes. Oh, Sean's coming in. Yeah, sorry, bully beef. Um, it was like a ration that they used to eat. Um, it was pretty 
it was a bit like it wasn't like spam, um, but it was effectively it was just it was fake beef, a variety of meat made from finely minced corned beef in a small amount of gelatin. So it is cut is more like spam. Yeah. Right. Okay. There you go. And they use the tins, empty tins, as soccer balls, footy balls, footy balls. Footy. Scores, scores were recorded. Okay. Uh, with one score between British and German troops being three two to the Germans. Ooh. And another between Scottish and German troops going the way of the Scots, 4-1. Nice. As for the Eastern Front, it wasn't as common. Uh, But there were reports that the Austro-Hungarian commanders initiated truce and the Russians responded positively. Okay. So it did happen, not as common. Uh, And again, it was kind of like the Axis powers initiating it. Yeah. Central powers, Axis and allies in World War II, Central and allies in World War I. Sorry. Thank you, Sean. It's interesting, though, because the media back at both countries or multiple countries didn't really report on the events either. No. The British media waited about a week and then um, the first news articles about what had happened, like the Christmas trees coming out. Uh, and I then, can understand why they wouldn't. And, and another week after that, photos were started to come. So I guess once the, the letters and stuff from the yeah. actual troops started coming home, they were like, yeah, this did happen. Like, look at this kind of thing or whatever. Well, you got to remember, like, there was no internet. No. So you had to actually physically get reports from one yes. place to another. Yep. Uh, the French media never really reported on it, the same as the German media who pretty much claimed it didn't happen at all and just said, yep, yeah, Christmas morning it happened for a, like a little bit, like there was a ceasefire. Yeah. And then the shooting resumed resumed later that afternoon. Like, yeah. Not to the extent of what act, like was supposedly actually happened yeah. where they had like up until New Year's Day and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So afterwards, what happened? Well, yeah, they went like you said. The weirdness of it—they went back to shooting each other and attacking each other. The, yeah, the next soon day, after. Soon after, yeah. there was also an attempt to have a truce on Easter Sunday by the German troops. Yeah, as they went to leave the trenches, uh, but they were warned off by the British officers and went, "No, no, no, not this time, buddy. We're not going to shoot you right now. But you get back in your trenches. We're not having. We're not doing this truce again because they had had the word come down from the commanders like, "You need do to, not do that. You need to stop yeah. doing this." And again, following on the, f- the next year, commanders on both sides had ordered not to repeat what happened the year before. Um, Understandable. And apart from some small sections of the front who did have a ceasefire at Christmas, it was not to the scale of what happened the year before with like multiple l- huge yeah. areas of the Western Front stopped. They were just like, no, nah, this is not having like small little sections happen. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And then, so that would have been Christmas... Uh, 1915, and then again, Christmas 1916 and 17, again, like really nothing. I guess to that point of the war- Things had gotten serious. Things had gotten serious. They had reason to kind of not like each other. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just this, I guess, perfect time in history and warfare where yeah. men were just- Not enough had happened. Yeah. Yeah. And they were just there doing their job and they're like, well, let's just, let's celebrate. But like you said, just how strange would it be? Like you've had- Weeks of fighting and then just a day of silence. And, singing, and you're all just out singing, singing Christmas carols, carols, kicking a tin of beef around. I mean, it's it's kind of cool in the humanitarian, like. Yeah. It's not, it's just weird. Like, the, it's not, you can't just be like, oh, it's cool. Like, it's weird. It is These weird. These people that were literally shooting each other decided to go and have a truce and like talk to each other and share stuff and stuff and give each other presents and yeah. like, yeah, odd. And it's never really happened again. It's just the, the one and only time in history of, you know, I mean, there's formal truces and stuff that have happened between warring countries, but not so much between the individual troops. Yeah. And wow. that's, that's, that's it. That's, that's Christmas. That's, that's no, that's, that's really not any, any more to it. They stopped fighting for a day and. And then just went back to shooting each other. Went back to shooting each other, yeah. It is one of those events that, like, you look at and you're just like, how? And it will never happen again. Mm. Wild. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't understand it. There's, Like I said, there was other stories on there, um, like soldiers in a farmhouse, and they just said they didn't necessarily meet other soldiers, but they could hear that either side of them where there was gunfire the f- day before, there was silence, yeah. and they said the silence was so eerie. Yeah. And just strange and- mm. Odd. Be very weird time, and, and a and, very weird time. And we've discussed it before, like how awful war would be. Yes, but and have, then to just randomly have a game of football with yeah, the other side, have like a pleasant yeah. day, yeah, almost, and then reconcile that the next day when you're shooting at them again. Yeah, how, how do you reconcile? Yeah, in your brain, odd. Anyway, good story. Thanks. I thought it was an interesting one with the time and 
Um, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas, everyone. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks for producing tonight, Sean. It's just morbid Christmas, everyone. Morbid Christmas. Morbid Christmas. Kind of. I like for the fact of the- oh, oh, oh. Morbid Christmas, everyone. The, there was enough join us in that time of year to, to stop something so terrible. Yeah. It goes to show the power of Christmas as a whole. Yeah. And let's leave it with that. The power of Christmas. Yeah, right, boy. Thanks for not yawning tonight. I was awake this one. <laughs> Even though we've had a big day. Do we want to get into why we've had a big day? Let's briefly touch on the big day sure. that we've had. We went to the Australia versus South Africa test in Brisbane. It was day two, and that was the end of the test. <laughs> that was the final day of the test. A five-day test that went not even two full days. What a day of cricket. wickets fell today. Wild. Not that many runs. The second shortest test ever in Australia. Yep. So, yeah, we've had a big, a big day. Even though it wasn't a full day, it was what, yeah. an hour short of a full day. It was an hour short of a full day of cricket, but still, we've been out of the house most of the day. Fun Sean's facts. Fact check something. Yeah, fun facts. The- so what we went to today was the shortest, second shortest test match in Australia in history. Notice I said in Australia in history. Mm. Funnily enough, there was a shortest test match in Australian history because yep. Australia was involved in the shortest test ever. How short was that test? 50 minutes. F- sorry, 50, 50 minutes. What? Was 50 it minutes. 17.2 balls. So according to Guinness World Records, the shortest test match ever was the first test between England and Australia at Trent Bridge, Nottingham in June 1926, in which there was just 50 minutes played. Was it the rest of it just rained out? I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> so a normal test match takes five days and a normal play, a normal amount of time played in a day. Is it 90 overs they try to get to? 90 overs and it's like six hours? Yeah. Something like that with, with breaks. It's three sessions of two hours. It's like, yeah, six and a half hours with like yeah. breaks in between. and mm-hmm. almost. It, it, was, uh, it was drawn that day. But the shortest completed test match was the fifth and final test match between Australia and South Africa at the MCG in February of 1932. Ironically, for a so-called timeless match, it was all over in five hours and 53 minutes. Wow. Albeit spread, <laughs> over th- albeit spread over three days with a rest day in between. A total of 100. A rest day? Yeah. A total of 109 points. Yeah, that used to be overs. a thing in test match. I don't remember that. Yeah, they'd have a rest day in the middle. Yeah, wow. Well, anyway, it was, a, it was an interesting day to be at the cricket. My hands hurt from clapping. So many slow claps that were done. So many early. slow claps. Yeah. What's with Australian crowds and not knowing when to start a oh, slow don't, clap? Don't start on that. No, nah, I'm, I'm riled up about that. I want to write a letter to Cricket Australia. There was two great arguments throughout the day that were mostly centred around Aaron. One was the <laughs> slow clap argument and the other was his- Can I just say there was no argument about the, that? Of James Cameron's iconic movie, Avatar. Firstly, there was no argument. Nobody argued with me that we were not clapping too early. <laughs> That was crazy. The bowler wasn't even running in and we're not cla- and we're clapping doing this. It's ridiculous. Please go into the comments and tell us if you liked or disliked James Cameron's avatar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Secondly, James Cameron, I'm not saying people didn't like it. I never said it was a bad film. I'm saying that it was an irrelevant film that should never have had a sequel. Just the all time highest grossing film. Yes. Because for many, many years before it, Endgame knocked it off. But even after it came out, people were like, okay. Nobody cared. Let us know if you cared. Let us know if you're actually waiting for the second film, which just came out, because I don't think anyone was waiting for it. I think the rest- I, I think you're saying that because you're a James Cameron stooge, Sean, but I reckon the <laughs> majority of the world would not have given a crap if the second film never came out. I have no words. Yeah, because you can't The only words it. I have is, thanks for listening this week. Um <laughs> Hit us up on John uh, with my- Hello, I'm Aaron. Co-host Aaron and producer Sean for the first week. Thank you again, Sean, for doing that. If you would like to find us on socials at Cheeky Tales Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we will have supplemental images going up on the day of release of the- the Don't promise that. (laughs) I've failed the last two weeks. You have been a bit slack (laughs) the last two weeks. We will have supplemental images coming up. Soon Look after release. <laughs> Follow us so that they hit your inbox. Hit your inbox of the map where the like uh, ethnicity of people in the Balkans area come from. Uh, I'm sure I'll find some other photos of potentially the false memory of the soccer being played, but at least yep. I think there are definitely photos of troops engaging with each other. So yep. that'll be up there. Um, yeah, go on there and follow those social accounts. Um, share us with... Someone you know who might be a history buff or who likes Christmas because it's technically a Christmas episode. Or even people who like test match cricket. Or people who like short (laughs) test match cricket games. Anyway, (laughs) 
Thank you all very much for listening. We appreciate the support and hope you enjoyed. And we will see you in the new year. In the new year. Good night. Good night. No good night from Sean. Sean hates our listeners. I'm just, no, cut him off. Cut, cut the episode. <laughs> I'm just a producer. I'm not, I'm not the third cheeky boy. I'm you purely, can still say goodbye. I mean, fa- fa- farewell. <laughs> May your hearts be filled with dreams. <laughs> good night, everyone. <laughs>